for the juice uh, I've been here for the whole day. Um, just one very brief announcement. Uh, following this panel, starting at 5 o'clock across the way in the new Newcomb uh, faculty, uh, the new building, the faculty lounge there, we are having a reception in honor of the stellar 15th anniversary, and that is generously sponsored by the Palo Alto offices of Baker and McKenzie, Tim Morrison, and Forrester. So we invite all of you to join us. Um, but now I'm going to turn it over to the panel and to the will moderate. Hey, thanks very much. Uh, so I work at CNET, part of CBS, and before that was at Wired and Time, and uh, spent some time at CBS News. And I work up in San Francisco under technology law and policy. I bring this up to say uh, that I have two disclaimers, uh, and then a disclaimer for everyone else uh, on the panel. And the first disclaimer is that my wife uh, is a Google employee, not working on this issue, and actually on leave um, uh, at the same time. At the, uh, at the same time, my employer, CBS, is on record, at least in early December, maybe, maybe, maybe uh, this has changed, you can ask them, not me, uh, as supporting SOPA in a letter to the House Judiciary Committee. So these two biases are real and perceived, will count each other out. Uh, I'm also instructed uh, to say that uh, some of my fellow panelists uh, may or may not be speaking on behalf of uh, their employer, so you shouldn't automatically assume that they're uh, representing their employer in every uh, detail. So one thing I wanted to do is uh, say that we really don't have enough controversy here at Stanford Law School. Uh, we, there's an event <laughs> called International Career Paths in Public Interest Lawyering recently. There's another one coming up on patent litigation. People don't say, you know, public interest lawyering, a terrible idea, let's ban public interest lawyering, or let's ban patents, or let's have them expire after 30 minutes, good luck getting the TRO in that time. Uh, but here we really do have a legitimate uh, and deep uh, dis uh, disagreement about SOPA, the extent of uh, any copyright infringement problem overseas, and whether we need any litigation or not. Uh, so uh, this is what should make this, if I do my job, my panelists do their jobs well, an interesting event. Uh, uh, we have Mike uh, from TechDirt. I will not joke about uh, TechDirt not being the same as TechCrunch. Uh, there's, uh, and Mike is a very nuanced uh, reporter. Uh, in his articles about SOPA. Let me read you a few of the headlines recently. Uh, if the RIA wants to talk about misinformation campaigns, let's start with the RIA's misinformation campaign. Uh, how much of the collapse of recorded music sales is due to the end of illegal price fixing? Uh, RIA totally out of touch. Rather than bitching about the future of SOPA, Rupert Murdoch should take, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and, uh, and so these are just a few of, of Mike's headlines, and this is why he's a must read on this issue. Very good uh, We have, um, on, the other, on the other side, we have Betsy, uh, who is at Fox Group Legal. And we, we have some nuanced statements coming from her chairman, News Corp chairman, Rupert Murdoch, uh, who took to Twitter last month to take Google to task. Uh, his tweet was, so Obama has thrown in his lot with Silicon Valley paymasters who threaten all software creators with piracy, plain thievery, piracy legal, Leader is Google, who streams movies free, sells advertisements around them. No wonder pouring millions to lobbying. It was a little abbreviated, but I tried to get the gist of it. And we have uh, Grinit from EFF, uh, which is a bit more nuanced than Mike. Uh, but I, uh, EFF did post a blog post saying uh, the factors of SOPA are publicly protesting, um, or, or sorry, um, the uh, companies are publicly protesting the scary legislation that endangers our internet infrastructure and threatens online free expression in the name of combating so-called rogue websites. And so that's at least some good heated rhetoric. Uh, and we have AJ from Jenner and Block, uh, which is Hollywood's favorite law, law firm, I think. Uh, there's, no, no, it's, it's, it's every, you know, every industry has to have their favorite law firm. Uh, the tech industry is Wilson Sonsini right down the street, off of Page Mill Road. And uh, um, we have Jenner and Block in Southern California. Last year, a magazine called Managing Internet Intellectual Property, and I never heard of this, but it called Jenner and Block the copyright firm of the year. Uh, his group has sued Usenet.com over copyright infringement, BitTorrent, uh, 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 BitTorrent sites over copyright infringement, sued Groxer, sped up to the Supreme Court, uh, sued Hotfiles.com over copyright infringement, uh, sued, a por um, uh, sued porn pirate companies on behalf of porn copyright holders for copyright infringement, and right now uh, they're uh, suing uh, YouTube and Google on behalf of Viacom over copyright infringement, and that is going up on uh, before the Second Circuit. If it infringes copyright, they're, they're either going to sue it or they're ready to sue it. Uh, so uh, these, these are our four panelists, and I'm delighted to have them here today. And I, uh, who is who's going first? Uh, is it Betsy giving the, the out, outlining the scale of the problem? 
if there is a problem. Yeah, so uh, good afternoon. I'm really pleased to be here. Um, I'm Betsy Zedek. I work at Fox Entertainment Group working on uh, copyright policy and enforcement issues. I thought it would be valuable if we started our discussion today with, with some sort of baseline um, exploring what is it what exactly is it that's meant, at least when people in my industry talk about a rogue sites problem? Um, what is it that SOPA, PIPA, and COICA before them were designed to address? Um, initially, <coughs> initially, what's a rogue site? When I think of it, I'm thinking about the worst of the worst, piracy and counterfeiting sites. Although the problem extends more broadly than just copyright uh, entertainment industry, and the proposed solution is much broader, extending to um, many forms of counterfeiting, trademark infringement, et cetera. In the context of my industry, I'm talking about sites um, whose raison d'etre plainly and obviously is piracy. I pulled up here just a screenshot. Uh, to me, what is a classic example of a rogue site. This is movie2k.to. This is the home page of that site. Um, and as you can see from the home page, this is a site that's full of links and extensive links for each film to movies, including the ones on the left, which have very recently or just been released theatrically and are not authorized in any way for online distribution. These are sites that in the bill's terminology are dedicated to infringing activities, have no significant use other than, or dedicated to the theft of US property was the terminology that came about in SOPA. So what's the problem with sites like this? Although I would venture to say that my industry can and does avail itself regularly of available legal remedies um, with respect to rogue sites that have a sufficient nexus to the US, there's a plethora of foreign-based sites of this nature that take advantage of the U.S. market and U.S. consumers and harm U.S. rights holders, but which we cannot effectively address within the current U.S. legal framework. This site, for example, is a .to, which, um, as I'm sure many people in this room know, is the Internet Country Code top-level domain for the island kingdom of Tonga. Um, so this is not a U.S. Re domain registry. At Fox, for example, about a quarter of the pirate sites that we monitor are on non-U.S. domain registries. That number is increasing regularly. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> and um, more than half of the sites that we regularly monitor and enforce on um, are hosted and based with operators outside of the U.S. There are numerous legal and practical hurdles um, to achieving civil, civil litigation victories or criminal enforcement against foreign rogue <coughs> sites. Um, the civil side of things, um, the DMCA notice and takedown structure is largely inapplicable or ineffective as against foreign sites. Um, and at any rate, what I think of as a rogue site is uh, the egregious actors, the worst of the worst, uh, inducers of infringement who would be um, or hopefully should be ineligible for DMCA safe harbor on that basis. The operators behind these sites are very often difficult to identify, locate, and serve. That's a significant hurdle. Um, many of these operators take steps to hide their identity, cognizant of the fact that they're engaged in what is criminal conduct, and uh, use all kinds of measures to do that. Some of them are not sophisticated and we're able to identify them anyway or through in intelligence measures can determine who the people are through their pride in their work. But um, even if we can identify them, they can be hard to serve outside the US. And more importantly, I think it's very unlikely that many of these, that many of these operators would come to the US to defend themselves in court and implicate themselves as the orchestrators of these sites, the people responsible for this sort of activity. Another trick is that we have had some success getting default judgments against sites that are outside the U.S. with, uh, with um, foreign defendants. Um, they don't appear choose to appear to defend themselves when there's enough of a nexus to the U.S. for subject matter and personal jurisdiction. But it can be very difficult to enforce a default judgment of that nature outside the U.S. We're basically going through a country-by-country -country analysis of my odds of getting any sort of real recourse or remedy 
um, with respect to a business that is conducted in a different jurisdiction. And finally, on the civil side of things, we're often unable to sue civilly operators in the jurisdictions where they are located. Laws may be different. Uh, we may not practically be able to go there. It could be a jurisdiction that I simply cannot set foot in um, and whatnot. On the criminal side, there's uh, a number of challenges as well, both practical and legal. Um, on the legal side of things, the um, there's an ability to go after site operators if there is some unlawful activity, criminal activity takes place in the US. Um, but frequently we have operators who are outside the US, in which case extradition would be required upon their apprehension, which can be a difficult proceeding. Much of the evidence is outside the US, so mutual legal assistance treaties are usually employed as a means to request such evidence. and. In practice, those are just up to the, the goodwill of the country receiving the request on whether they will, in fact, respond and provide the evidence. And, uh, and lastly, the proceeds and instrumentalities of the crime are located outside the US as well. However, um, rogue sites, the kinds I have in mind, do rely on inter intermediaries of various nature for traffic, um, for supportive infrastructure, and for revenue. Uh, many of the third-party intermediaries are located here in the U.S., and they are facilitating the rogue site's ability to access and profit off the U.S. market and U.S. consumers. There are legal tools available, um, and they can frequently be effective to deal with the role of U.S. hosting providers. Law enforcement is able to address sites <coughs> with US hosting providers and domain name registries, for example, operation in our sites or the mega upload case, but our current legal system lacks the effective tools to interrupt rogue sites reliance on US ad networks, pay processors for revenue, and search engines and access providers for traffic. The next thing that I have here is really just a case in point about the, um, the role of the intermediaries. Here's an example search I did, I believe, this Monday. Um, intending to complete in a search for Watch Chronicle, which is one of Fox's latest theatrical releases at the time, had really only been in theaters for about two days. Um, Google helpfully suggested an autocomplete for Watch Chronicle online free when I put in Watch Pro. Uh, but the number one search result was that site that I pointed to before, that's, uh, that I alluded to before, movie2k.to. And in fact, 15% of the traffic to this site comes from Google. And it uh, is re receives 2.1 million unique U.S. visitors per month, even though it's on a DT.to and located out of the U.S. Um, the, the content on this site there is encouraged to sign up for subscription accounts. This is something that relies on U.S. pay processors. So we've got PayPal, subscribe with major U.S. credit card in order to be able to get revenue to the site as an alternative to advertising revenue. Um, so in sum, when we're talking about this foreign rogue sites problem and what it is that rogue sites legislation was meant to address, it's this reliance on US internet intermediaries as a means to, ooh, that's pretty awful, <laughs> um, as a means for these rogue sites to access and profit off US consumers. That's what rogue sites legislation sought to address. Hey, uh, let's continue this way on the panel, and you're up with my friends. Hello, Kevin. Hello. 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 Hello.
Um, well, there was a lot of talk about foreign rogue sites, but the definitions were sites that enable or facilitate infringement or take deliberate actions to avoid confirming a high probability of infringement. Um, for the market-based approach, which I will talk about in a moment, um, at least in SOPA, it was not restricted to foreign sites. Um, in, and also, it would be enough of a site that had even a portion that was infringing. Now, that got fixed in SOPA number two, the manager's amendment, which was good. So it became sites that would be subject to seizure or forfeiture in the United States if they were domestic. So that was, everyone agreed, an improvement over the earlier language. HIPAA um, targeted sites that have no significant use other than infringement or are designed to engage in, enable, or facilitate infringement. And I decided to sort of quote out, but the enable or facilitate infringement part was, was important. Um, what did they do? Actually, you know, this is, this is so bad, double-sided. Did a lot of stuff. Um, <laughs> so, but some of the things that they had in common were this. Um, first, the most controversial provision, DNS or search blocking. Um, basically, SOPA and HIPAA authorized a court to issue orders requiring ISPs to prevent access to targeted domain names. Um, we call this the DNS filtering provisions. Um, and then also, you could get orders requiring search engines to filter search results. So essentially, you would see a different version of your search than if you were in, like, Italy, say. Um, eventually, the White House objected to these provisions enough that I think we were definitely going in a direction where those were going to be out um, before the protest, which we will talk about later. The next provision was that was controversial was the follow the money approach. The idea was, okay, let's go after the money. Let's go after the payment, the sort of, the, whenever they get money from the United States, let's choke off that money source by getting court orders requiring payment processes like Visa or MasterCard not to process payments for those sites. And getting court orders requiring ad networks also not to service those sites. Cut off US transactions related to that. Now SOPA number one was particularly controversial when the president was introduced because it allowed this to happen via, with nothing more than a good faith notice from an IP rights holder. So that was very terrifying to folks. Um, then there was a revision that actually required some court supervision. So again, pro um, this was progress. Uh, but one thing to note, sorry about this, is that you could be DMCA compliant, you could comply with the DMCA safe harbors, but you could still be targeted by this follow the money approach. Um, secondly, there were some provisions that were not, uh, didn't get a lot of attention and I think should have, and they were the various anti-circumvention provisions. So one thing is that the bills allows you to target violations or alleged violations, not just as sort of traditional copyrights and trademark rights, but also violations of Section 1201 of the DMCA, which is about breaking encryption. And this really fell by the wayside, but actually could have had quite drastic effects. In addition, SOPA allows the Attorney General to go after entities that offered products that would allow you to bypass SOPA orders. And there was a lot of controversy about, or concern about well, what would fall into that path. Um, then there was the vigilante provisions, which um, <laughs> vigilante provisions, which um, uh, provided immunity to service providers um, and payment processors who acted on a reasonable belief or a good faith belief of infringement, and there was a concern that that was going to encourage service providers and payment processors to overblock and overfilter. <coughs> okay, why were the internet's worried? <laughs> Here's a list. <laughs> this is in no particular order. One was with the DNS filtering um, provisions in particular interfere with internet security and create a balkanized internet. Secondly, over breadth. We can see years of litigation, full employment for lawyers, but maybe not so good for innovation. Heavy compliance costs, meaning it shields innovation, which is why the venture capitalists complained about it. Um, the human rights activists were worried about it because they felt it said to signal to the world that if you call it IP enforcement, it's okay to engage in DNS blocking. And, and what if you call it something else, like when China does it, we think it's bad. Um, there was a First Amendment concern, which I think AJ will talk about, about access to non-infringing speech. Uh, there was a fundamental concern about a lack of transparency and public participation. People felt like this was going to affect me and no one asked me what I thought. And please, could someone ask a technologist at some point? Um, there was also concern that it wouldn't work. OK, 
okay, that the, there was going to be a lot of collateral damage. At the end of the day, it would barely make a dent in online infringement. So we had these incredibly high costs. We didn't have a study that we'd actually have any benefit. And this all came to a head and it really sparked the final activism when we reached the markup of SOPA in the House Judiciary Committee. When it became abundantly clear that many of the people who were pushing SOPA in particular did not care that they did not understand the provisions in their own. <laughs> and this was one of the funny things that came out of it. People did the sort of SOPA bingo, you know, nerds required. Anyway, we can leave that out for a while. <laughs> but, um, but that really scared everybody. It wasn't just what was in the bill, but it seemed to us that the people who were pushing it didn't understand what they were pushing themselves. And we're actually rather proud of not being technologists and not really understanding technology. So, that's it for me. 90 seconds early. Okay. Uh, Mike, uh, let's talk about what happened next. Uh, protests, right? Uh, yeah, I need to switch to. So, where is the SOBA activism up right up there? Maybe you can that, yeah. Cool. All right. So, um, there are a whole bunch of different things. I'm going to focus on the, the activism part in terms of what happened next. Um, I think there's a, a, a separate interesting discussion that I think uh, I, I was asked not to, to discuss as part of the presentation, but I, I just want to bring it up as something we can discuss later, hopefully, which is questioning some of the um, principles of whether or not this really is a legal question at all that should be worked on versus um, potentially an innovation or, or business problem. But that's not what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about the activism part in terms of what happened next once the, the bill came out, um, and specifically trying to focus on um, debunking some of the myths. And, and these were kind of the key myths that, that came out after, uh, in the last couple of weeks after everything went down, which was you had Chris Dodd talking about that it was um, uh, business interests and, and he in other uh, instances named Google specifically that turned people into corporate uh, pawns. Um, you had Car Carrie Sherman just this week in the New York Times calling out Wikipedia and Google for duping users um, and uh, John Fithian from uh, the theater, uh, National Association of Theater Operators um, saying that it was Google made its point, they're big and top and we get it. Um, and I think this is a narrative that is unfortunate and incredibly inaccurate. So what I want to do is try and go through the reality. Um, starting, actually, uh, we could go all the way back to the Koika discussion. We're going to start with right after PIPA was introduced, uh, which was in May. Um, about a week later, there was a paper that came out um, from some of the most respected names uh, who understand DNS filtering at its core, putting out this white paper talking about the serious problems of trying to um, do, use DNS filtering within Protect IP and how that would impact online security and issues uh, along those lines. Um, soon after that, in June of 2011, there were over 100 legal scholars, some of the most respected legal scholars around, who uh, sent an open letter to Congress pointing out serious problems with the way Protect IP was structured uh, and the issues that it raised in terms of things along the lines of prior restraint and free speech, um, some of which uh, I, I assume AJ is going to respond to to, to some extent. Um, in September of 2011, over 160 entrepreneurs um, from around the country um, spoke out about problems and how it would have a chilling effect on innovation. Um, in November of 2011, we suddenly got a burst of things as the first hearing was held around SOPA. So we had a, a whole bunch of different human rights organizations put out a notice talking about the problems that they felt, uh, some of which Corinne mentioned earlier. Um, the ACLU came out with a paper about how it would be a problem. Um, Consumers Union came out with a paper about how this would be a problem. Um, Sandia National Labs uh, wrote a letter explaining how this would have issues for uh, cybersecurity and online security. Uh, and then on November 16th, the day of the um, uh, the, the hearing, which was a, a, within the Judiciary Committee, which was a, a very stacked hearing, it was sort of a five to one hearing, and it was structured very, um, on purpose, I think that the one was Google to, to set up the, this myth that it was sort of Google against the world. Uh, and yet, you know, what happened that day was 
the, the first one was called American Censorship Day, when a whole bunch of people spoke out about this. And over 6,000 sites same, signed up with over a million letter, uh, emails sent to Congress and even over 3,000 printed letters. Um, just some guy in San Francisco who set up a system to make it really, really easy for anyone to uh, fill out an online form, which he would then print out uh, and send actual physical letters to Congress on the assumption that they might pay a little bit more attention to that. Uh, and he spent the weekend actually printing them out and putting stamps on stuff and, and sending them. Uh, these are you know people all over the country speaking out on different sites and certainly not uh, Google. One of the really interesting things, and this surprised a lot of people, was that one of, one of the sites that decided to participate and really uh, apparently, we all found out afterwards, just made the decision the day before, it was a site called Tumblr, one of the more popular blogging platforms. They set up this um, really very simple system to allow their users to call Congress, um, and they ended up getting almost 90,000 calls uh, to the congressional switchboard. Um, at their peak, it was, they were hitting um, something close to four calls per second, I think, was, was what the the amount was. And this was just um, basically the CEO of that company decided that he was going to you know, uh, tell people about this bill that maybe they didn't know about and get them to speak out. And, and they did. Um, leading into December, suddenly we got more people speak out. Uh, 83 uh, engineers, some of the most well-known, most recognizable uh, technologists around spoke out against it. Um, the American Society of Newspaper Editors, uh, you know, this is a group that is you know, they produce intellectual property for a living. They are certainly not Google. Um, Lawrence Tribe, one of the most respected First Amendment scholars out there, um, spoke out very, very specifically, wrote a very long paper detailing the First Amendment problems. Uh, the Heritage Foundation, which has a long history of agreeing with the entertainment industry on almost everything, came out speaking out about how it was a problem for um, security. Um, Fractured Atlas, one of the a group that represents probably more artists than, than any other group out there, came out saying this is the wrong way to protect that thing. Uh, so, and this was, uh, I jumped ahead, sorry. That was, that was in December leading up to the, uh, the, the markup, the sort of uh, half a markup, I guess, which took a, a day and a half. Um, and then that led into uh, January, which was when Fractured Atlas uh, spoke out, uh, a group of artists and creators of some of the most famous uh, artists around. You had people like Trent Reznor, uh, Neil Gaiman, Aziz Ansari, uh, mm -hmm. Andy Samberg. These are all people who work in Hollywood, are, are um, famous stars in Hollywood. Um, they are certainly not Google. Uh, they are not Wikipedia. They are people who work in, in this industry and they put out a letter saying that this was not, they did not want this done in their name. Uh, and then, of course, where the, the, the big uh, protests sort of started to get a ton of attention was Reddit spoke out and said that they were going to black out their site on January 18th. Um, and, you know, Reddit is a company that is owned by Condé Nast, um, you know, a large traditional content producer. And yet Reddit, the Reddit community very, very strongly opposed this bill. And they spoke out and they said, we're going to make a statement and what we're going to do is, is black it out. From there, uh, Wikipedia followed and very specifically said that they were responding to Reddit's decision to black out. Uh, Jimmy Wales made a statement saying um, that, uh, that he was interested in following it, but as with anything with Wikipedia, it was entirely up to the community. And that this, he made this announcement just a few days before January 18th, which was the day that Reddit decided to, uh, that Reddit was going to black out. And so there was this very rapid conversation. Uh, an, an entirely open conversation that anyone could take part in on Wikipedia. And what you got was a whole ton of people saying that they support, they support, they support. Uh, more and more people saying they support, they support, they support. More and more people saying they support, they support, they support. I was going to continue to do these screenshots and I began to get really tired of it. And so I put it all into a single screenshot. And that's what it looked like. With almost everyone saying that they support it. I'm sure, of course, Wikipedia did block it out. It was only after all of this happened, at the very, very end, that Google said that they too were going to make a statement on this and put up a, a block and a notice and a way to, to contact Congress. The end result, and I know I'm just about going over my time, is over 10 million people signed a petition, over 8 million people looked up how to contact Congress on Wikipedia, 4 million people sent emails, 115,000 sites, and uh, over, what was that, 1 billion people were blocked from accessing one of these 
websites. Um, tons of things. Let's, let's, uh, um, hold just, on. Okay, <laughs> that, that, this is the last slide. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> this is, this is, this is, this is you have to give more time I'm, uh, I'm to your adversaries. I'm, I'm just about done. Tons of conversation on Twitter. The end result, obviously, being that, that many of the folks in Congress changed their mind, decided that this was a bill that had serious problems and they were going to listen to the American public. And that. You wanted to get to the artwork, right? <laughs> this is no, this was somebody else. So, but that's, that's, it. that's my last slide, so. But basically the idea being that the, the public spoke up. Betsy, I want to thank you for um, extending some diplomatic immunity to a couple of people from Southern California. I'm mean, nice used to go up here and uh, uh, talk about this. My background is both as a copyright lawyer um, who litigates on both sides of the V. I represent people who get sued for infringement, and I um, also uh, worked on a couple of enforcement matters. I've also have a background as a person amendment lawyer, represented media companies, newspapers, and broadcasters in the past as well. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, perspective. Uh, before we talk specifically about some of the, the uh, free speech issues that are that were raised by um, Pippa and Sopa. Uh, some of the uh, criticisms of the bill that uh, we just heard may have sounded a bit familiar, and I think that's because they are. Uh, I think every time there has been an attempt uh, in the last uh, dozen years or so to um, protect pro intellectual property rights and enforce copyright law on the internet, there has been a, uh, an outcry that it's going to destroy free speech, stifle innovation. And so I think we need to ask ourselves if that's really true. Is the sky really going to fall if we protect property rights on the internet, if we enforce copyright on the internet? We've certainly been told that it will. Uh, when the Digital Millennium Copyright Right Act was being debated in 1998, this grand compromise of technology industries and content owners, we were told that it would chill or even freeze product design and innovation. I don't think anybody would, would agree that product design and innovation has been uh, frozen since 1998. We were told when the INDUCE Act was being considered in 2004 that it would eliminate innovation, stifle competition, prevent products uh, and technologies from reaching the market. When the Grokster case was being litigated in the Supreme Court, which I had some minor involvement with, the, uh, we were told in various amicus briefs that it's going to upset the balance of power, it's going to have a devastating impact on product innovation. The Electronic Frontier Foundation uh, told us that it was going to chill innovation to target the entire technology sector. We'll witness the end of revolutionary product of technologies, such as the iPod. I think after the Grokster decision, uh, something like 300 million iPods were sold. Protect IP Act, China-like censorship regime, Orwellian approach to law enforcement. And then we're told uh, by the Consumer Electronics Association president that it's going to shut down Amazon, block the patent office. I think um, what gets lost here is there has to be um, there has to be a middle ground here between the uh, extreme perspective that uh, that any regulation of the internet, any enforcement of copyright law on the internet, uh, particularly law that is targeted at particularly egregious actors like the kind that uh, Betsy described in her presentation, sites that are dedicated to copyright infringement that are exist and whose business models are, are, are based on uh, infringing copyright and uh, uh, profiting from other people's intellectual property, that it's not, um, it, it's not the end of the world if we have a legal regime, if we craft a legal rule that protects speech, protects innovation, but makes their conduct illegal. And I think that's ultimately the lesson of Rockster. You saw that emerging even in some of the amicus briefs from uh, some of the technology companies in, in the Grokster case. Uh, these were internet companies like Bell South and Verizon and so forth. Um, essentially threw the defendants in that case under the bus and said, uh, we don't condone what these guys are doing. These were peer-to-peer -peer sites that were where the business model was essentially copyright infringement. They were based on getting the, the natural user base over to, to so they could profit off of it. They say, you know, a business model that's based on Copyright infringement should be subject to some form of, of legal sanction. I think that's where um, 
that's certainly the, the aim, I think, of PIPA and SOPA, is to uh, create a legal rule that targets uh, businesses that can't be reached otherwise by the DMCA and other uh, U.S. intellectual property laws, foreign websites that are causing a, a significant uh, piracy problem, uh, and, uh, and, and to create a way to, to reach that kind of conduct. The challenge, and I think uh, there, are, there, there are a lot of specifics we can debate, is, is how do you do that without um, reaching other conduct, reaching other uh, non-infringing conduct or, or free speech. I think it's, uh, so I think there's a couple of things we can, um, we, we should bear in mind when we talk about the, um, uh, the, the First Amendment and uh, the interaction of the First Amendment and the copyright law uh, and, and the application of copyright law and the First Amendment on the internet. Um, first, I think while the internet is, um, and we can take this slide down, I'm not sure quite how we do that. Um, while the internet has, I think, had profound impact on democratizing speech in some ways, uh, and is in some ways represents a return to the sort of traditional uh, notion of the individual pamphleteer and so forth, uh, doctrinally it doesn't really present a different world uh, for uh, copyright law or the First Amendment. Uh, I think some of the criticism of attempts to regulate uh, Piracy on the internet come from internet exceptionalists who think that there just should be no regulation at all, or uh, criticism that reflects an underlying antipathy about uh, copyright enforcement generally. Uh, but I think uh, the internet is a robust form, and there there was a period in U.S. law where there was a lot of concern that we we shouldn't uh, enact rules that would somehow smother the internet in its crib. I think we're all beyond that now. Uh, I think the uh, the lesson. Of ACLU versus Reno is that you need to treat the internet, internet speech like other speech. And I think the lesson of the Grokster case is you need to treat internet businesses like other businesses. If the business model is based on uh, infringement, then it should be uh, subject to legal sanction. Copyright law and the First Amendment are not necessarily antagonistic. In fact, there is uh, one of the probably the most lengthy Supreme Court discussion of the intersection of copyright and First Amendment was the Harper and Row case the mid-1980s where the court opines that copyright really serves First Amendment interests by making speech, by creating incentives for people to make speech possible. Uh, we've, that case and subsequent cases have made clear that copyright law accommodates First Amendment issue, uh, First Amendment interest in two uh, very important ways. One is the so-called idea expression dichotomy, the fact that copyright law um, uh, regulates expression, that copyright infringement consists of infringing other people's expression, that copyright law does not protect ideas and it doesn't protect facts. Uh, so if information wants to be free, information, facts can be free, expression is protected. Uh, and I think, and the other one is, is the fair use doctrine, and I think those, uh, what the Supreme Court has subsequently called traditional contours of copyright law uh, are really constitutionally required to be part of copyright law. Uh, there are some situations where First Amendment considerations can enter into the remedy phase. I think the eBay case and subsequent cases like the Salinger case in the uh, Second Circuit uh, suggest that. Uh, but I think that uh, uh, the, um, the enforcement of copyright rights and the uh, issuance of injunctions against copyright infringement is not traditionally been treated as uh, a, a content-based restriction on speech, and it's not been subject to, it's not been considered a prior restraint, uh, particularly in a situation, particularly in the piracy context, where the speech that you're restricting is um, unauthorized distribution of, which is really not even speech at all, but it's unauthorized distribution of, of copyrighted content. So I think we may uh, get into some of the more specific aspects of, of people and so as we go along, um, but, uh, in general, I think it's a uh, it's something that needs to be they need to be analyzed on a, on a case by case basis. I don't think you can uh, necessarily conclude that just because you are uh, proposing to enforce copyright law on the internet, that all of a sudden you're going to have uh, a regime of Chinese style uh, speech repression. Thank you. So my uh, suggestion is that we have, uh, have some uh, back and forth on the panel and turn it over to the audience for a good uh, chunk of time for questioning. Uh, Betsy, I, I think you uh, get a rebuttal. Um, 
some more time. Uh, any, any response uh, to your panelist concerns uh, saying uh, SOPA uh, raises uh, these issues uh, and uh, has security and uh, free speech questions attached to it? Um, sure, you know, I think AJ did a, did a good, great job addressing what some of the speech concerns are and, and whether or not some of those are misplaced. Um, I, th I think one of the major issues um, which was raised and, and for me was quite frankly surprising to see brought up um, was the issue of um, some of the prisons were about due process and notice to um, parties who could potentially be impacted by this, including the rogue sites themselves. And I think it's, it, it's worth noting that the bills themselves had um, all kinds of safeguards rooted into them and um, traditional federal rule of civil procedure style due process and notice, and on the notice front, even a couple other hurdles to cross um, in order to give, um, attempt to give the rogue site operators notice of the intent to proceed. So um, the bills allow injunctions only in accordance with Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 65. So it applies the same procedural protections that federal law affords to all civil litigants. And um, the there are uh, enumerated notice requirements, um, attempts to, through due diligence, do, excuse me, I can never say that, due diligence, uh, locate the operator, try to reach them through any contact information they put on their site, through their domain name, registrar if possible, and then anything else that would be uh, required by a judge under federal rule of civil procedure 4F. So um, Floyd Abrams remarked in, uh, in defending the bills against that type of criticism that the procedural protections are so strong, uniform, and constitutionally rooted that it's no exaggeration to observe that complaints in this area do not to really be with the bill, but with the federal rule of civil procedure itself. Um, and I think that's, uh, I think AJ is really the expert on first, first Amendment issues, and so I will defer to, to what he has said there. But I would want to underline um, you know, what he was saying, referring to the Harper and Rowe decision, um, in which the Supreme Court said that copyright itself is the very engine of free expression. Uh, so there is that contrast there. I think um, what we haven't talked about at all either are the um, internet architecture and security <coughs> concerns that were raised. Um, and I'm not a technologist, and unlike some people, I'm not proud of that. I wish I understood that um, a great deal better than I do or am capable of You're doing. Not one of the entries on the <laughs> main bill scorecard then. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's my understanding that. Um, some of the concerns about harm to DNSSEC um, were really related to the issue of redirection, um, and that's something that was corrected in the manager's amendment to, uh, to SOPA, and something that I think was missed by a lot of the community that was up in arms about that issue. Um, so it was clarified in the manager's amendment that redirection was not required. Um, it could just refuse to resolve, we talk about DNS blocking, it could just refuse to resolve to the IP address behind the domain. And um, site blocking is something which exists today in at least 20 OECD countries. Um, and for IP infringement in particular, for copyright infringement, that happens in a number of countries, which I think uh, most people respect the legal systems of. I know others will take issue with them, but the list includes Austria, Australia, Belgium, Denmark, Finland, India, Ireland, Israel, Italy, Malaysia, the Netherlands, Singapore, South Korea, Spain, and the UK. Uh, many of those under Article 8.3 of the European Directive. But that we have not seen the internet's break in the context of any of that side blocking, either in or outside the context of IP infringement, and in fact, it does happen in the US outside the context of, the context of IP infringement. This might be a good point to pause and turn it over to the other side. Uh, there's uh, would either of you uh, might or friend, like to respond to that? But there's another thing you might want to respond to is AJ saying that some anti-civil folks think there quote, should be no regulation at all. Maybe he meant you. I don't know. <laughs> okay, can I we, we're can still waiting for the EFS proposal. Um, okay, well, two different points. Okay, so first thing, I actually want to respond to something else that AJ said, which is that, because I've heard this from a lot of sources, you guys are just engaging hyperbole, really don't worry about it. You guys always complain. Right? Every time we have new laws, and so why are you always complaining? It never really turns out that way, so don't worry, which I have to say, coming from the entertainment industry, like, just hurts. 
people who call the VCR the, the, Jack, the, the Jack the Ripper waiting to take us down. Um, that hurts me. But I want to say that also, <laughs> that's, that's wrong. Have the other point, so. But that's wrong. What about the Crosser case? This is going to end the world as we know it. Actually, it's, it's I think there's shoes on both feet. Is the here's an example that I want to point to that I, that, that I hear a lot, and I think it's important to set the record straight because it came up specifically in this debate, which is the DMCA. And there was a lot of concern early on when the DMCA was passed that it was going to have a lot of negative impacts on innovation. And guess what? Those concerns were true. Okay? We've had scientists silenced because they were going to talk about something that might circumvent encryption, and they just wanted to share that information. We had plenty of companies sued out of existence because all they wanted to do was talk about encryption or provide certain tools that might be used for a lot of different things. Um, we've got this incredibly cumbersome exemption process that, oh, by the way, I hope you all filed comments in today, um, to try to get exemption Late. solely so you can get <laughs> so you solely you can, so you can get the NS circumvention measures out of the way of what would other be a, otherwise be a clear fair use. You want to go to the FF website? We have a 20-page paper that will list all the examples of how the DMCA has been misused. So actually, a lot of those predictions turned out to be true. Um, what was good is the DMCA set up the safe harbor regime, which has also been abused, and we've got plenty of documentation of that too. That said, it did provide some space for innovation, and that was good. So I just want to say <laughs> that you know, the concerns that were expressed back then have been turned out to be true. Uh, secondly, on whether the EFF or somebody else has some counter proposals. We hear this a lot too, although they don't like to call EFF out particularly. But um, the, the notion that, that the right answer to bad legislation is to propose some other legislation strikes me as fundamentally misunderstanding the problem. The only thing that has ever really worked against online infringement, if that's really your concern, is innovation. That's what's worked. And we see this with the report with the context of the reporting industry. They finally started doing well when they came up with business models that could actually compete with free. That's what turned the tide. And now, actually, digital sales are hugely tough. So that's what works is innovation. There, I just don't believe that the answer to the problem is to be found in DC. It's, it's, it's not there. And all you're going to do, if you, if you focus your energy on District of Columbia, you're going to end up spending a lot of money on lobbyists, and it's going to get you nowhere. A lot of those lobbyists live in but this isn't law schools. Let's talk about a proposal. I, mean, it's, it, I get a show of hands. Anyone actually like a, the, an alternative to SOPA uh, called the Open Act, which Senator Wyden and Representative Issa have uh, been uh, working on openly? I think he's now for, formally introduced this legislation. Anyone? No? It depends what you mean by like. Okay, I mean, <laughs> that's not nice. Uh, but I mean, like, I don't want to get shot, but I'd rather get shot in the arm as opposed to the chest. Uh, I mean, it is, uh, you, you, you would, I, I suppose, like this over nothing, uh, but you, you think that, so, that it doesn't include blocking, so it doesn't really do that much. Well, I, I do like the symbolic message behind the introduction of open, which I, Corinne's right. You know, you don't have to propose counter legislation just to be justified in in objecting to legislation. But I do think it was encouraging to see some of the most vocal opponents of the bill um, come out and say they agree this is a problem and they agree that something should be done. Um, they just think that something different should be done, which I think is a a helpful way to move the debate forward and show that this isn't just about thinking there shouldn't be any regulation on the internet or any interest <coughs> on the internet or ability to deal with this foreign rope sites problem. Um, I have carefully looked at the bill. Um, I do think it is flawed. So in that regard, I don't like it. But I, I did want to make sure to give some credit to the notion that um, there, you know, why didn't we initially put a block on the legislation? Um, sat down and thought, all right, well, what do I think would be a better way to deal with the problem? I didn't present it to him, but certainly it was the same sort of thing in mind. But from Hollywood's perspective, I'm not sure both of you can adequately represent Hollywood. I know this debate is bigger than just Hollywood. There are a lot of groups that 
signed, signed on to the pro civil letters that were outside what we'll call Hollywood. But would, would legislation do you think be acceptable if it did not include uh, uh, IP blocking or DNS blocking or some form of actual blocking as opposed to all the money? You know, I really can't speak for Hollywood on that, and in fact, I can't speak for Hollywood or even Fox or News Corp on anything I say here today. But, um, but, but personally, I do think that DNS blocking and working with ISPs to figure out a way that they can um, participate in preventing U.S. consumers from being accessed by these sites um, is a valid exercise. But I was still supportive of SOPA after. Um, Smith announced that DNS blocking was going to be coming out, and what we were likely to see had the bills continued before this internet blackout was, was a version that had no DNS blocking, but had something, let's study this, let's look at how it's done in all these other countries, um, and see if this is something that in a few years we might revisit. We have about 45 minutes left. I'd like to um, see if Mike and AJ want to respond, and then uh, have a few folks out, out there ask questions. Uh, what do you think? Sure. Uh, so but you, you, you've been sitting there patiently. Yeah, <laughs> biting my tongue. Um, no, uh, Corinne actually checked off about 70% uh, of the points that I was going to raise, so <laughs> that was really helpful. Um, Are you an actual scholar or fellow there? <laughs> I have no connection to EFF whatsoever, um, but apparently um, you have some more views on things. Um, I, I also just... Shocking. shocking. Yeah, so just to... So, so I'm going to add to one thing she said and then actually respond to one issue that, that wasn't covered, um, which, which AJ was talking about. So um, in terms of the question of, you know, does this need a legislative response? That was what I said, you know, at the very, very beginning. And I, and I think that there's no real evidence that this is a legislative problem that needs a legislative response. And I think that's really, really important because if you are attacking a problem that is not a legislative issue with a legislative solution, you are only going to create more problems. So that, that is definitely a concern. I think that you know it's important to take a step back and really begin to recognize the nature of the problem. And the point that Corinne raised about how innovation has been the solution all along is really important. And the key example of that working is if you look at the situation in Sweden, specifically with music. Obviously, the Pirate Bay was based in Sweden, um, had tremendous usage in Sweden, uh, uh, you know, especially for music early on. And yet, if you look now, it's barely used for music at all in Sweden. Almost all music-related things in Sweden go through Spotify, which is a legal uh, authorized company in Sweden, based in Sweden, and it basically took away that market from the Pirate Bay by offering something better. 84% of 18 to 30 year olds use Spotify in Sweden. Um, and so, and yet, the US just got Spotify about six months ago. And that's because the industry blocked them. They've been trying for about three years to negotiate a deal to bring Spotify to the US. And the, the industry did almost everything possible to make that impossible uh, until they finally agreed to a deal, um, which was a, a very, very expensive deal for Spotify and their questions about whether or not Spotify can succeed as a business because of that. So that's, that's, that's on the, the, the innovation question. On the, the, the First Amendment question, I think that um, there, there are two points there, and I think that they get mixed up in, in this debate, and I think that's where some of the danger comes in. And then there's a question of, are you, you know, is infringement uh, free speech? Obviously, no. I think people agree that infringement is not free speech. If you're infringing, that can be taken down. The question is the collateral damage and how much other speech is taken down. And that's where you get into the question of prior restraint and the problems there. And even Floyd Abrams, who Betsy quoted in his letter talking about why he didn't support SOPA, said that uh, protected speech would be blocked by this bill. He didn't think it was a big enough concern. Different people have different levels of what they think is a concern. But when you're talking about protected speech also being taken down as collateral damage, that's where the concerns come from. And we have very real examples of that happening and happening today under existing law, which is why many of us are nervous about expanding that law. And one of the, the classic cases which has gotten attention recently is the case of under the, the last change to copyright law, which is the Pro IP Act, which uh, in a very tricky way, which wasn't clear to people looking at the bill, enabled the ability, supposedly, though it's being challenged a little bit, for the US government to seize domain names and basically take down websites with no notice, no trial, uh, or anything, 
Um, they did that to a particular site called thejazzone.com, which was a popular hip hop blog. It was seized, was taken down, was held. There was no trial, nothing, uh, the, the, the site had no way to um, respond to that. The site was held for over a year and then finally handed back. There was tremendous amounts of non-infringing speech on there. It was a blog, it was, um, you know, it, it was. Uh, I think we have a counsel for the jazz in the room. We, we may. Maybe hiding in the back. We did at one point. I don't know if he's still here. There he is. I won't uh, hide for long. <laughs> <laughs> I expect to see you with the microphones. So. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and so we have examples of existing speech, you know, being censored. And, and you know, we can talk about, you know, what the DMCA, hopefully, and, you know, and there are good parts and bad parts of that, that targeted specific speech. It didn't target entire sites. When you begin to get to the point where you're targeting entire sites, the real fear is, is about a lot of the damage. I think, um, AJ, did Just you to make a couple of points of response, I think um, uh, with respect to um, restricting more speech than, than necessary, there's a couple of points that, that need to be made. One is in the um, uh, in the manager's amendment in December, uh, there was a change to SOFA so that entire sites would not uh, be subject to the, um, uh, the, uh, the, either the government action or the private, private action with respect to payment processors and advertisers. Their um, uh, disabling of those services would be limited to the portions of the sites and the subdomains that, that were found to be dedicated to infringing activity. So I think that addressed some of those concerns. I think the, the overall definition in um, uh, PIPA, for example, of an internet site dedicated to infringing activities uh, uh, is designed to target specifically those kind of rogue sites that Betsy talked about. And it's not just sites that enable and facilitate infringement. That wasn't the language, it was sites that had no significant use other than engaging in, enabling, or facilitating uh, copyright infringement, or that were marketed, designed, and, and operated and used primarily for that purpose. So it's not, uh, there was never any danger it was going to target um, sites where there might just be an incidental act of infringement here or there. It was businesses where that was really the, the, the focus. Uh, I think they're, they're in the debate over whether it was a prior restraint or not, there were these dueling uh, letters, one by Professor Tribe and one by Floyd Abrams, um, uh, both of whom are uh, exceptionally well-known First Amendment experts. Uh, I think the point in, um, uh, that, that Floyd Abrams made in his letter about um, there being some incidental su suppression of speech uh, is something that's inevitable uh, and, and not something that's new uh, if a um, if a uh, book is enjoined after a determination that it's copyright infringement, there may be some expression in there that that wasn't in the original work. It's nevertheless infringement. If a uh, an adult bookstore is shut down because criminal activity is going on there, obviously there's there's some effect on speech. The Supreme Court has recognized it's not a prior restraint in that case. There, if it. And in the, the, the DMCA cases have been, that have been litigated poorly and in Elcom, for example, uh, the court recognized that, that there was not a prior restraint on speech, even though there was some uh, incidental uh, <coughs> restriction of speech when you um, enjoined a site that was basically dedicated to providing links to uh, encryption uh, technology. So I think the, um, the, 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 the way to address the concern that there is uh, that there may be uh, more restriction uh, on uh, non-infringing speech is through uh, narrow definitions of, of the kind of site we're targeting and through the kind of provisions that we saw in the manners and then that were limited to the particular parts of a website that uh, were engaging in the, or were dedicated to uh, infringing activity. Let's turn this over to the audience. Uh, and uh, you're going to have better questions than I will anyway. Uh, so, if you could identify yourself uh, briefly, that would be wonderful. And uh, yes, sir, you're up. Hey, I'm uh, James Humble from San Francisco Chronicle. Um, you know, the, the, the supporters of the bill throughout have always suggested that it was narrowly targeted, but the second section of the first version of SOPA basically said that um, it did it apply to US based sites as well as foreign ones. Uh, or even a portion of the site, if it's dedicated to the theft of U.S. property. And one of the definitions of that was if it is taking or has taken deliberate action to avoid confirming a high probability of infringement, which public knowledge ended up boiling down to lacking sufficient seals to prevent copyright infringement. And so, 
the question I had just for AJ and Betsy was whether or not ultimately was it an overreach in the beginning, and in retrospect, uh, did that end up sort of poisoning the conversation and, and making it hard to have a conversation? Well, you were talking about I think, I think that particular piece is actually really interesting. It's been very interesting for me to observe what happened with that because. Um, the reason that language went into the bill was it was an attempt to have some predictability. So some of the criticism of Protect IP was, well, maybe it's this higher standard than what initially came out in SOPA, the first version, but that how are people to know and uh, feeding into some of the concerns about is there a potential to, to stifle innovation um, or for people not to be able to predict what falls within this, what's the type of rogue site that we're talking about. And, and, and that particular language was an attempt to give people some clarity to say, well, here's standards that are in existing law. So um, we had the Grokster standard for inducement incorporated into that language, and then also the specific language that was just quoted, which came from global tech um, and the thought of um, the willful blindness um, and culpability for willful blindness. And the thought was that that was something that the tech community may really be able to understand because that should be predictable, recent Supreme Court decision, their lawyers should be able to work around that. But it did end up, it ended up that people really became concerned about that provision and the manager's amendment ended up um, going in and, and, and making a correction there. Okay. Yes. Unless they you go. No, you go ahead. The only thing I wanted to say uh, about that is I do think that that, speaking to the notion of overreach, and, and I think it's interesting that this notion, like, well, here's what the intentions were, and I, I think that what that feeds into for me is another concern about, well, maybe the thing to do would have been to, to ask first if, if that would, because I'm not trying, I'm sorry, I'm being a little facetious, but I'm, not, but I'm actually just trying, want to speak to something that's important, which is that the, so that SOPA 1 in particular was just launched with very, very little consultation based on everyone that I have spoken to who's in DC. And we're out here in San Francisco, so we don't always get consulted anyway. But, um, but nonetheless, you know, a lot of the people that were affected would have been expected to at least be at the table in the room to talk about that, um, to see if in fact that intention was accurate. And I think that you know part of the ongoing concern about this, and this is important for something that I hope we'll talk about too, which is what's the way forward it's that you need to bring more people into the conversation and more viewpoints into the conversation if we're going to do something as important as even contemplate new regulations for the internet. It's so just you're, too important to you know, You're saying it opposes them all anyway. So why bring someone to the conversation if you're going to say no or no? Because I can point out why no. Um, any other responses? Well, well, one one, one okay. real quick point on that was that um, if that process was Locked out so many people. It, did, it wasn't just you know folks like EFF who were locked out of that conversation, but but even people in Congress um, who were on the relevant committees who said that normally bills like that would get passed around for discussion beforehand said that that, that the original version of SOFA was not. Nobody other than a very very small group of people saw that until the day that it dropped, and that was a huge concern not just for for the, the you know people like EFF and, and public knowledge and, and whoever else. But even for people in Congress, thought that this was not the way that those are normally done, and so it was a complete lack of openness for anyone towards anyone who might have a different opinion, and that led to some of the the, the, the language problems. Let's move on. Hi, I'm Andrew Bridges. Uh, I'm just wondering if you think that anybody who says that laws do not inhibit innovation lacks imagination. Um, <laughs> How many people that have noticed that you can't uh, copy onto your iPod from a CD player? Okay. It would be nice if one could. But you can't do it because it's illegal under the Audio Home Recording Act of 1992. How many people have noticed that Blockbuster never offered CD rentals along with movie rentals? Okay. Can't do it because of the uh, 1984 Record Rentals Amendment. Um, you, can't, you can't make a backup of your own DVD. And we saw an uh, international humiliation when I assume, prompted by Hollywood, President Obama offered Gordon Brown, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, 25 DVDs of American classic movies to take back. It got back to 10 Downing Street, put the DVD player, and on the screen it said, sorry, wrong region. <laughs> Thanks to the DMCA. 
There are real problems. They copyright law causes. And I, and I have to tell clients, you can't go into this business. Sorry, it's a brilliant idea, but it's too risky. We do not have a United States Chamber of Aborted Commerce. <laughs> okay? So, and, and but AJ, I take you that, you know, there is a comment that people who are opposed to any regulation or enforcement, well, I, I sort of get that. You talk about meeting in the middle, I sort of get that. I just have a quick list here, okay? <laughs> 1982, Piracy and Counterfeiting Amendments Act passed. 1984, Banned uh, Record Rental Amendment Act of 1984, Banned uh, Record Rentals. 1990, Copyright Remedy Clarification Act. 1990, uh, Computer Software Record Amendments Act, you can't rent software. Uh, 1992, Audio Home Recording Act, um, which essentially uh, uh, hamstrung um, digital audio tape players and many discs. Uh, 1994, Uruguay Realm Amendments uh, Agreements Act criminalized uh, recording of live musical performances. The 1995 Digital Performance Right and Sound Recording Act. The uh, 1996 Anti Counterfeiting Consumer Protection Act. 1997, the Electronic Theft uh, Act. Okay, okay. Because this is central to the problem. Yeah, okay, 1998, Digital Land Copyright Act. Okay, let's meet in the middle. Which of those will you give up to get so far? Ah, uh, for sure. <laughs> uh, okay, which ones? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, did we only make it to 1994? 98. Really, the year was recent. There's, recent there's more. And I was barely started. <laughs> I'm sorry about that, Andrew. There's, okay, I mean, well, this is a fair question. I mean, if ever, let, let's put everything on the table. What, what, which one of these bills uh, would, would you take, or, or laws can be repealed in exchange for SOFA? Well, I, I, I'm not going to point to a particular one right now, but I, I think there's a valid point in all of that, which is something that uh, affects both sides of the argument here, which is that bills um, are drafted and are passed and are implemented at a point in time. And then technology changes, everything changes. Um, and things which may have been intended to deal with a very simple problem of various technologies that are listed there, many of which are obsolete today, um, are not really adept to deal with emerging technologies. Um, and we are always confronted with balancing there. Is new technology harmful and not yet encompassed by legislation, so therefore is clarifying legislation or other legislation needed, or are new technologies potentially stifled by old legislation that never contemplated that something like this might be possible one day? So the answer is all of them? <laughs> <Yeah>. No. <laughs> how, how about term extension and statutory question is, is, is what, uh, you know, what legal rule do you craft to deal with the particular problem that, that you're facing, and I think that's what uh, the, the issue with Pippin and SOPA is what, what legal rule makes sense to deal with this particular problem of rogue websites. I do think it's 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 incorrect to, to suggest that um, that no that, that innovation is is as is, is Corinne said the answer and that in, in the absence of uh, any copyright enforcement to deal with cases of, of clear piracy or people basing businesses on piracy, that innovation will, will show the way. I mean the fact that there are so many uh, business models now for distributing music in, in, in the U.S., iTunes, and Rhapsody, and Boom, and now Spotify, and everything else, I think has to do with um, the industry recognizing how people want to uh, receive music and experience music, but it ha also has to do with the fact that there's a legal regime where Napster is not a, a pirate uh, site anymore, where the rocksters and kazaas of the world were, were uh, sued and then uh, ended up selling those cases so that they now filter and respect copyright. Where you have the way of LimeWire uh, and just, so forth. Just I mean, as I think much available. I mean, there's just as much. That, that didn't make piracy go away. That just made Napster software go away, right? I, mean, there I, think, I think there's an argument that it dampens piracy and that it, 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 it makes it. Have uh, you looked at the numbers? I think it makes it harder for people to. But look, the, also, those, those services that got stood out of existence were the ones that had to dra drag the recording industry kicking and screaming into giving people what they wanted. And, it, and if you look, so so as another example, right, so right after this whole SOPA thing happened, when, when one of the key examples 
of a site that, that was claimed repeatedly was a perfect example of why SOPA was needed was mega upload, right? And the day after the whole protest, the US government shut down mega upload anyways. And it's been described as the worst of the worst of the worst sites in the world. I mean, that, it's described in such terrible terms. And there, you know, the, the, the management there certainly is questionable, has done questionable things, and, and there, there may be issues there. But what happened after Mega Upload got shut down was we suddenly saw all sorts of artists speak up about how they personally used Mega Upload, not just to distribute their music, but to make money because they had some interesting business models. And Betsy showed a screenshot in her opening uh, uh, talk of a, of a site called Put Locker and talked about how they have these subscription plans so you can, you can get things. And, and the implication was that because you have these subscription plans, that they are somehow profiting off of piracy. And that, you know, that may be one aspect of what happens, but what also happens is that many artists themselves use sites like Put Locker, which is very popular, especially among the hip hop community, to distribute their own works, sign up for an account, say, you know, world, get my music for free, and I get paid for it. It's a way for them to distribute music, so it's an interesting, innovative business model that is being shut down because of things like Mega Upload being involved. Well, I mean, Mega Upload, to me, underscores, you know, we're talking about the characters behind it, that um, many of the sites behind these and the type of rogue activity we're talking about, the type of infringing activity I'm talking about is big international crime, racketeering, money laundering, etc. cetera. Um, but yes, there, there are people who have come forward and said, I, I heard a lawyer say it on an ABA call this morning, in fact, well, I, I used mega upload to, to upload my articles and, and got $2 a day because, because people downloaded my articles for mega upload. And there, I think this brings us a little bit back to the speech thing. Yes, this person has, has a right to put their content out there. And, and like copyright owners and, and big copyright owners like my company has a right to earn money off of that person's content where there is a market for it. But, um, but Mega Upload was a site that engaged in, to me, very egregious conduct, intentionally designed to promote the use of its site for infringing and in fact discouraged other uses, deleted files that weren't downloaded very much, warned users that um, they couldn't rely on the site for storage, and um, really built a business on an unlicensed distribution of the most popular forms of copyrighted content. And so why do we need SOPA if we can deal with it? Uh, is there's a microphone over there? You can get YouTube. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, is it okay if I just respond to that? So, so Mega Upload had, made, had, had some, I guess, fortuitous dis business decision making. And in fact, if you read the indictment in that case, you'll see that they were following things like SOPA, PIPA, and operation in our sites very closely. And Kim.com uh, was getting advice that you better move off US servers, you better move off the .com domain, but they did not. And therefore, we're subject to jurisdiction uh, based on the US servers here, infringing activity in the US. Um, it may have been, it's not the type of site that operation in our sites is targeted, but other sites like it with .coms are subject to the jurisdiction on that basis because it's a, a domain hosted with VeriSign in, um, in Virginia. I've been a very patient fellow. <laughs> uh, that's okay. That's okay. That's okay. Richard, it? We run a report at ITIF called um, Steal These Policies. It was strategies for mitigating digital piracy about two years ago, which we believe is the intellectual basis of so much that, um, and I'm not ashamed of that. Okay. We, so it's going to be a good blame. What kind of problem? I'll specifically take the blame for the DMS filtering provision because my colleagues tell me that that was my idea. <laughs> <laughs> Especially now. <laughs> so, so, what, so, so what is ITIF? Uh, this is your group. What is the it? The Information Technology and Innovation Foundation in Washington, D.C. by State Bank. And I live out here in Seoul. Um, now you caused me to lose my brain about that. <laughs> <laughs> your so we're only DNS like Okay, so the report <laughs> said, yes, the business models need to be the updated. There's, the entertainment industry is leaving tons of money on the table. But we don't really expect that Congress can actually force them to do that. Uh, so we didn't recommend any, any legislation in that area. We did recommend a follow the money approach, which I'm glad to see has been adopted in the Open Act. So whatever action Congress takes, I mean, at least it will reflect our report to that extent. 
And we went with the DNS filtering because we believe the DNS filtering would be sufficiently effective to enable consumers to distinguish legitimate sites from non-legitimate sites that were taking their credit cards and selling them other content. Uh, and but you know this whole fight about DNS security and everything developed you know after two years basically after we wrote that report. And and I'm tempted to say that the mistake we made there was not being moratorium because if we called for IP blocking there wouldn't be any issue with DNS security, okay? And I expect the next iteration of this legislation because of the uproar over the DNS redirection language that was in the first draft of the two bills, unfortunately, we didn't call for redirection, but for non-response. Because of that uproar, it's gonna get more workable. And, and so, actually, the question that I have is for mine. Because you said 10 million people, you know, signed these petitions. How many of those people do you think actually know what was in the bills? How many people had read them and understood the terms of art that were in the bills that were referring to court decisions? And, and versus how many were just reacting because somebody told them it was going to allow the government to shut their blog down if somebody put a link in a comment that, you know, went to a bad side? I mean, obviously, I, I have no idea to, to, in terms of exactly how many people knew the, the specifics of the bill, but I think that this is this has become a line of argument that, that's become very popular for people who supported the bill is that you know the people who spoke out were, were ignorant. I think that's that's really rather insulting um, for the idea that people can't take the time to understand the basics. Did everyone read the 78-page bill? Um, probably not, uh, but there were uh, an awful lot of very legitimate problems, many of which were raised here. Corinne raised a whole bunch of them, most of which were, uh, were uh, the sites that were complaining about these things, highlighted the very legit problems. They did not say things like, it will shut down your blog. They were very, very specific to, to the different issues raised by these bills. And so I think people recognize that they, they quite reasonably, that the overall structure of the bills were, were problematic. Whether or not they read the, 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 the whole thing, um, you know, Probably not, but I mean, what, what we saw was that, you know, I talked to congressional staffers who claimed to have written the bill who didn't know sections of the bill. So I don't know that that's, you know, that's a fair argument. There were clear problems with the bill. People were told what they were, and they had the, the ability to express their opinion about it. I also think that, you know, with respect to certain examples of the security issues, and also the First Amendment issues, I think, you know, there's a point at which sometimes people have to trust experts. And when 83 engineers, starting with Vince Cerf, tell you there's a problem, I think maybe you should say, I think there's a problem. There, there <laughs> was, a, there there was, was a problem. When they said that, there absolutely was a problem. They said it the several first draft times. Draft that that be, and the first draft of SOFA did have a problem. They filed in, they, the engineers submitted comments. And how, how long did it take to fix them? Uh, well, Protect IP wasn't really active. I mean, at the time, they, 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 there was the there hearing was, last day. The White House said there was a problem. There was, but, right? so I mean, there the was, manager's was, amendment for SOFA actually addressed those concerns. It addressed some of the concerns, addressed some of the concerns, and and left many of the concerns in, and and even Lamar Smith admitted later on that there were more concerns that he was going to adapt the bill again. So, you know, the the idea that clearly, you know, now lots of people are admitting that there were problems with the bill, but you know, we never we never saw the, the complete fixes. I'll, of I'll absolutely agree with no no hesitation at all. There were problems with the process in the house. The process in the Senate was vastly superior and much more open and much more concentrated. Which, uh, and, and, and we just had this debate online, so... Uh, well, let's, let's, not, <laughs> let's not do this. I mean, this is actually now ancient history. We're talking about like 2010 now. Uh, so uh, can, can, I, uh, can, can you look to the back of the very short line? And, I, uh, and Andrew, I'll encourage you to uh, come down again if you want to continue the conversation. And yes. Hi, so um, my name's Andrew Robinson. I'm a lawyer for social media startups. So I have a pretty big horse in this race, but I also feel like I've been on a lot of different sides of the issue because I was uh, general counsel in Harmony for three years, which is mostly the employment owner side of things, brand ownership. And before that, I was in MySpace. I was one of the first lawyers there in 2004 to 2006. We went from one to 100 million users in a time. Um, but uh, you know, I'm not going to go on and on about, the, about 
SOPA itself, other than to simply say that you know, I don't think I've ever seen in my 15 year career any one particular law proposed had this range of collateral damage um, imposed. I mean, to the point where you have the ACLU and the ACLJ, you have EFF, the Heritage Foundation, you have people with the most diametrically opposed political, a lot philosophical views I've ever seen in my career, all monolithically aligned in an opposition. That list that CBT put together over a thousand people, you know, opposing SOPA, they posted monolithic opposition from virtually everyone other than the content industry and even, I will say, even the publishing industry, which is apparently, last time I checked, the one that's dying because of the internet. And TV and film and music seem to be making plenty of money still. You know, the publishing industry was the most silent. You're saying we, we need SOPA for silent newspapers. To say <laughs> <laughs> I'm asking, apart from that, that uh, terrible uh, New York Times piece that some people at this table were uh, uh, tweeting about today, um, you know, why is it that the, that the loudest, most influential critics seem to be almost entirely film and music and not publishing in all of its various ranges? When in fact, you know, written content is the most useless priority because of the small amounts of bandwidth storage that it takes. This is a question to consider. But all that is, is tangent. My main point that I want to ask about is about roster and about um, vicarious and contributory infringement and all that. Given that Rockster, Morpheus, Huzzah, LimeWire, Airshare, Napster, on and on and on, all of those services were ultimately shut down or legalized in the wake of the Rockster decision, which really, I think, clarified the rules of the road around infringing sites. So, so the question is to infringe. The question is, since many, if not all, of us were carefully structured to avoid the jurisdictional issues by staying outside of the U.S., there's always one particular <coughs> so myself, Pacific Islanders. So the question right. is, the question is, the question is all of those managed to be successfully shut down without a SOPA or a pipeline? Why do we need one? Fair question. I think there are two potential people to respond to. You appear, appear here sites like and services like the ones that you describe. Um, it's not my position that there's no effective legal remedy against those sites that have servers here, sites that have um, sites that don't hide their identity and are willing to come to a U.S. court and defend, even though you know they may their operators and their business, the business behind them may be located in another jurisdiction. There are certainly plenty of services. On the, um, on the download side of things or peer-to-peer -peer side of things who have come to the U.S. to defend themselves in court and are proud of the work that they do, um, you know, for better or for worse, from, from my perspective, for worse, but who identify themselves with their business um, and come to, to be tried on the basis of, um, of what they think is defensible in it. Um, and many have been taken down on the basis of coming here and defending and losing civil litigation um, my concern and, and my thought for why these, why more is needed is because we have sites like movie2k.to where the person behind that site is hiding himself from me, from the MPA, from, from whoever is interested in trying to find out who, who that is. And, and it is not, I guess I could try, but I, I suspect, this is just an example, if, if I file a lawsuit tomorrow on behalf of Fox in federal court in the Central District of California, naming that site, naming the operator, because I can find out who it is, they're not going to come here. And then I'm going to get a default judgment, and I'm going to figure out, well, what am I going to do about this person who may be in Bulgaria, or maybe in Belize, or well, maybe have assume, assets that assumes, in Mauritius? That assumes you can get the complaint served in the first place, which you might not be able to do, because you can't. Well, I'd have to find the person to, to be able right. to do that. So right. to be fair, so I've been there and done that. You have domain names, the squatters that you know registered something on their harmony.com or something in Moldova. We didn't go after them. We didn't try to reclaim that domain squatter. We had to just, you know, give up that fight because we're not going to go litigate in Moldova. Understood. I guess my question is, since so I'm not a litigator, how did the industry succeed in shutting down the Kazaz and the Napsters and the Broxers and Morpheuses and Airshares and LimeWires and that lengthy, lengthy, lengthy list? I don't think they all out of um, EFF-like uh, lofty principles of online freedom voluntarily came to the U.S. to defend themselves in court. So I'd, li I'd just like to know what the tools were that were invoked by the industry in those cases that successfully managed to get to the point where we had a U.S. Supreme Court decision in the Rochester case, which ended the discussion on peer-to-peer. -peer. And basically, I think, has deterred an entire generation since that case, since decided what, five, six years ago, 
Well, I'd say, on, to begin with, getting some of those defendants served in that case was not an easy thing to do uh, by any stretch of the imagination. Um, part of it, I think, was the fact that uh, the case was perceived as um, perhaps altering the legal rule and people did choose to, to, to avail themselves of uh, some excellent U.S. counsel and fight it. Um, and, and try to try to affect what the legal rule is going to be. I think there are a, a, an awful lot of other sites that uh, are offshore and unreachable uh, because either you can't determine uh, who the owner is, you can't get the person served. Uh, they're in a jurisdiction that sort of announces they don't respect, you know, U.S. copyright law, and they're not going to enforce court orders. Uh, it's a uh, it's it's a difficult. It's a difficult process, and I think I think you know I think Betsy's exactly right that it was in some ways kind of happenstance that that Mega Upload was a uh, a dot org or dot com that was that was able to be um, subject to, to U.S. jurisdiction and had the main server in, in uh, uh, a registry in the United States. So it's a uh, uh, it, it's a difficult problem reaching reaching those defendants, and, and I, I don't think for for something like the Besides Betsy's talking about, they're going to want to kind of make a test case out of it because I think they know what the result would be. Let's take another question. Yes. <coughs> Hi, my name is David. Is yeah. this David Sanger. Actually, I'm a professional photographer and I make my living as a creator um, and off licensing copyrighted material. And I actually am one of the people that did download the Lipa and Sofa and the band of the And I also downloaded every bill that was referred to this and I understand them. So some of us certainly did, did our homework. Um, there's been a lot of discussion in the photog photographic community about this, and a lot of photographers don't really understand um, the consequences. They think that it will protect them. Um, they think that it will protect their photographs that are, they see as being used all over the web. Um, photographers have also been subject to really just some national turf camp campaigns by the movie and film industry. A lot of creators come forward and say, oh, I, I, I'm in favor of copyright, so I really want to support Sopra and Epa, without really understanding the consequences. I have two questions, really. One is, I sort of see this as, a, as setting up a two-tier copyright system. These bills are really only about film, Hollywood films, and recorded music. They refer, in the language, to all intellectual property. But I'm under no illusion. You can't find out whether a site is dedicated to infringing photography, because you can't find out if a photograph is copyright or not. You can't find out whether a, new, a, a line of text is copyright, because there are no resources. You can check a Hollywood film or a, a label of music, but you can't find out if a photograph is copyright at all. Believe me. Um, and so I'm concerned that this is sort of setting up a two-tier system where films and, and recorded music have one level of copyright protection, but poems and photographs and children's drawings and all the billions of other things that are copyrighted really don't have this level of protection. Um, and the second question I have I'd like to address is, is that issue of innovation, and it says this, this won't promote innovation, but I would wonder if someone wanted to set up you, son of YouTube.Romania, they want to go to invest, venture capitalists and say, I want to set up a video sharing site in Romania to share user-generated content. Now, YouTube may not be thought of as a rogue site by some, but it is thought of a rogue site by the Viacom and others. So some people do think that YouTube or YouTube.to or YouTube.Belarus is our infringing rogue sites. And so the, the, the issue with, with uh, innovation is that venture capitalists are not going to fund user-generated content sites when they're in fear of their being shut down, their payments cut off summarily if, the, if somebody can find a U.S. district court judge somewhere to issue an injunction. So I'd, I'd like that addressed. I, I don't know the details of how injunctions work, but I'd like you to address that from the um, innovation uh, Side. Okay, two tier topic, copyright and YouTube.ro. Well, to address initially the, the, the concern about a two tier copyright system, you know, I think a, a lot of that concern is what was intended to be addressed by having a private right of action in the bills. So, who better to know whether or not your work is infringed and you own a copyright in that work than the rights owner themselves? Um, the other thing is, is that you know, I have seen, and, and I do this professionally, I look at these websites all the time, so, so maybe it's, it's much more anecdotal for, for the vast majority of this audience than it is for me, but I regularly see sites that set themselves up dedicated to the infringement of one property, um, 
that are not on US domains um, that nevertheless are problematic. So, you know, watch free chronicle movie.eu or watch free Simpsons dot some of dot to. We see that sort of thing and um, it's scales back the level of um, rights owners who are impacted by it. So it's the sort of thing of, well, I might not take that to the MPA because that's just us at Fox, that's just hurting us. But I, I hear what you're saying, that it goes smaller and smaller. But the thought is that a private rights owner, you should be able to find a site, go into court with a private right of action. You wouldn't be able to have the same recourse under the way these bills are structured with the same number of intermediaries being impacted. Um, but, but that right was in there. In addition, you know, the DOJ is, is its own entity and anybody can go and make a criminal, or, or this wouldn't be criminal, but can make a referral and a complaint and a suggestion that this is something that bears investigation and a test, you know, this is my stuff, it's not unauthorized. And there are groups of independents in various industries who organize themselves to deal with the sort of issue that you're talking about that you as a photographer on your own aren't able to assess the scope of infringement against an industry. Um, I first, the private right, private right of action concerns me as a photographer. I mean, I, I think that, that the idea that I could go against some site and simply claim that, 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 that because they were using my images, they could shut the whole site down uh, doesn't, seem, doesn't seem right. Well, the site would be shut down, and you'd have to convince a federal judge that this site was dedicated to in, in infringement well, let me give you some suggested sites then. I mean, we've got Tumblr, we've got Flickr, we've got Pinterest. Now, are those rogue sites? Are those sites that, it, were they to be hosted in Kazakhstan? Uh, and they certainly have a lot of uh, unauthorized photographs on them. Uh, is it, is, are those sites that you think someone should have a private right of action to take down? Well, that segues, segues into your YouTube point, which is, from my perspective, that's not a site that's dedicated to infringing activity. That's not a rogue site. and. Um, the there are reasonable people <laughs> like me. Uh, listen, I, I have just so, of, just so I you have, know, the, the Viacom against YouTube case is, is about the the way YouTubers run as a business in the very early days of, okay, of YouTube, okay. and that YouTube now uh, actually filters copyright and uh, shares revenue with copyright owners when uh, copyrighted content is is, is shown next to advertisers. So, so is, is, Right. It, they would have mentioned that. Is it is it is it a legal requirement that they filter content? Is it a legal requirement that they filter content? Or, or where where in the law is it? Because uh, you said it's okay now because they filter content because they share revenue with, with the. Well, I'm just I'm just saying that the, the business model of YouTube now is not. Uh, I, mean, it, it, I think the uh, the question that for his hypothetical venture capitalist is: Are you? Uh, is, is someone going to go into the, into the business that's that's going to uh, so respect copyright so and, and so or, they, or, or the or argument is that the, the YouTube.ru or, or, or whatever um, they have to when they propose it to the investor they have to also say that we will build our own expensive version of content ID uh, in order for for us to get an investment. Well, I mean, venture capitalists, what they do is they look at. At, at opportunities and they assess risk and the chance for return and um, they do that already in the, in the, in the contours of, of assessing whether somebody might be liable for inducement I would I don't know if the initial venture capitalist investor they investors were. in YouTube knew some had any awareness of some of the things that came out through discovery in the Viacom case about welcoming and encouraging infringement at that so, time but <laughs> people are, are are having to worry about legal things when they're making a decision to invest in of anything really. But see this but if Silver and Pippa had passed, what they, they would they would actually know something for certain, which is that part of their investment, a lot more of their investment would be spent on compliance and monitoring <coughs> and managing legal risk than on building the new technology. It would have to be just from the get go. Right? So I mean in some ways I wasn't so worried once the managers have known pass, I wasn't so worried about YouTube's continuing mm -hmm. viability. I'm worried about the next YouTube. I'm worried about the service we haven't even thought of yet. That is not going to be able to get funding because the venture capitalist that is going to say, look, I would, but you, like it sounds like you have to hire a lawyer. It's like you're employee number two. So I don't think it's a very good investment. For uh, I think the issue is also with user-generated content. That whenever you have a site where the, the somebody puts up a site and then users, i.e. third parties, put content on it, 
Uh, under DMCA, you've got the co copyright owner responsible for challenging that and how you take it down. Let's, um, uh, let, let's move on to uh, other folks with questions. Uh, uh, what I'd like to do is, is take a bunch of questions in quick succession from anyone, and then if we have time, uh, we can turn over the panelists. And so the mics are open. Uh, Aaron, you're up. Uh, uh, Baron Sober from Tech Freedom. We were uh, very critical of Sobra, but we come out as a group that does win copyright, does win its problem in applying uh, full versions of films on the our thought concerns really what about the balance there, but second is the question about the process. And the process I saw happen with, with both Sobra and Pippa was very much like what happened this last summer uh, on Fight of Data. Mark Smith, who pushed through Sopa, uh, as you so know, also pushed through a bill, H.R. 1981, that uh, imposes uh, sweeping uh, data uh, retention mandates on human service providers and then lets law enforcement get access to all that data without having to go judge for a warrant they can just issue their administrative subpoena. And in both cases, we saw the same sort of pattern play out where uh, the chairman, the chairman Smith in particular, really ignored uh, experts. Uh, and in the case of Sopa, as you've already heard, held one hearing and really staged it to set up Google as, as the only real critic. Didn't listen to expert testimony, did that develop the manager's amendment, which I also thought was a great improvement, a step in the right direction. Even that was only introduced just a few days before the markup. So my question for Betsy and AJ, as somebody who really does share your credit in finding the copyright system that works, and, and is more enthusiastic to say about the Open Act, is don't you think there was a really troubling failure of process here? And don't you think that that failure will indeed really kind of undermines the moral authority of the copyright system? Um, don't you think that the copyright industry would be better off going through a more lowercase o open process um, and, and not uh, allowing, and it's not really your fault, but allowing your champions in Congress to, um, to sort of resort to this sort of tactic? So going through this next year, the question was particularly, how do you want the process to go? How would you ensure that it is informed by experts so that we understand what the consequences of legislation will be and make it informed? So please don't actually answer this question. Yeah, we have a, um, <laughs> uh, a very related question, actually. Um, and it's also for Betsy and AJ. And my question is, can you go to the representatives of Congress, I think it's five departments, sorry. Uh, can you go to the representatives of Congress who are helping in, uh, introduce these bills and ask them to listen to people before we get a bad bill. And the reason I'm asking this is last September, uh, one of the members of the House Judiciary Committee, Representative Goodbody, came to Silicon Valley at a town hall meeting. I asked him about PIPA. There wasn't a stuff yet. I handed him the Mark Lemley letter on First Amendment. I had him the crop of white paper on DNS being broken. And I said, will, when the House bill comes out, will you do a better job than PIPA? And he patted me on the head and said, yeah. The, the House bill would be much better than PIPA, and what we got was SOPA 1. And that, I think, caused a part of these problems. And can you go to your people and say, your representatives say, make the process work better, and you won't get as much flack, you won't get a January 18th. So we don't have, um, Andrew, do you want to pick up on the offer? Um, we have another mic. Yes. One last thing. Um, you know, the, the Hollywood industries have a reputation for litigating really, really, really aggressively. So I'm not sure that's true. Even though they've gotten a $1.5 billion verdict against a single one of them, that would be 24 songs. They're not aggressive because they take every short time at But they don't really want to have to prove ownership of copyrights when challenged. They sort of ask courts to give them a buy on that. Uh, they don't want to have to prove the actual transmission for the violation of distribution right, they say we want this making available right because it's too hard to prove transmission. They don't want to have to prove irreparable harm to get an injunction. They don't want to have to prove actual damages, so they got statutory damages. So they don't have to do much under current law, but what I see is uh, happening in SOPA and PIPA is they get to do even less, because they get to outsource it to government to go do the work for them. And yes, it's up to DOJ, but I think that the article way is placed five of its lawyers in the uh, that in DOJ positions, so that's nice. They don't have to pay them. Um, so the question, <laughs> and, and, and one thing that's important about the outsourcing. They're like, yeah, that place is large as It's nice to outsource the enforcement because somebody else will pay for it now. Um, and more importantly, when the government seeks a preliminary injunction, unlike a private plan, the government doesn't have to put a bond up to protect the defendant against the disastrous economic consequences of a misguided injunction. So now the Hollywood uh, uh, 
claimants don't have that risk. Um, so, you know, this seems like really uh, shifting uh, a lot of responsibility away from Hollywood. And, and I get if it's necessary. But my question is this. Well, let's say that's speaking for cost. How many rogue sites have you sued that you actually invested the money in suing who escaped the clutches of the law because they were outside the jurisdiction? Uh, if, um, uh, I'm going to cut off that microphone. You've got 30 seconds because we're running a little late. Uh, uh, sorry, Richard. Okay, I have a quick question. My name is Megan. I'm just kind of a private citizen question. Okay, I'm from Spain. I have a four-year-old and I want to teach this to the Spain. I cannot buy a DVD in Spain and Jane here for my daughter. I cannot buy a DVD here that is in Spanish, but I mean, I like Latin America, so short of going to the private page. What are my options? Why don't we think about immigration? Because I know I'm not the only one in this situation. And everybody it is so easy to make content available to me. And I'm willing to pay. I'm pretty young. Okay, um, uh, you've got 10 seconds. So uh, Paul Vixie wrote a blog post about a year ago that said more than half of all the new DNS registration, domain registrations on the internet today are from malicious domains that want to engage in criminal activities like identity theft. Does anybody think that's a problem? Okay, we have uh, a bunch of questions. We're mostly queued up yes. by the panelists. Uh, so, four is yours. Sure, well, I can say two questions at least talking about process and, and what do we think about process and, and do I want to go, you know, talk to uh, legislatures about making sure to engage more people in the process. Um, just to be clear, I am not a lobbyist. I sit in LA and think about policy things and their implications for litigation we might subsequently bring, et cetera. Um, and through SOPA and PIPA have learned much, much more about the sausage making than I would ever want to know. Um, and I think, uh, Something that was very interesting to observe was to see all kinds of people say, oh, so that's how they make the sausage. I didn't know that that's how this works. Uh, because I think there's many instances where people who are concerned about legislation um, and its potential impact uh, decide that they are not pleased about the way things are happening in Washington. I think that's why we're fortunate to live in a democracy with elected officials who are responsible to their constituents um, and where we do have, I think, a great degree of, of, of access to legislators, at least as compared to other countries. Um, am I going to go to a, um, a senator or a representative who uh, may have been a supporter at some point in this bill and, and make sure that they you know, sit down and take meetings with particular people? No, I'm not involved in that. Um, but. I don't, I'm not so convinced that something so different happened here um, than happens all the time in Washington. And I think just a lot of folks were um, tuned in to something that they may find distasteful in, in other circumstances as well. And, um, let's we'll leave that on. If you'd like, a few seconds, we're uh, going to wrap this up. No, but I mean, I think sort of as, a, as an outside observer, I'm not, I'm not a lobbyist either, and I'm not really involved in the government relations aspect of, of any of this. But as an outside observer, I think the question is not. Uh, it, it's really not a question of whether um, you know the content industry should try to engage in a more open process. I think they're going to have to next time around because I think with the the um, the uh, campaign that uh, that Mike described uh, in his in his presentation, uh, they're going to have to you know, I think make a a more compelling public case for the need for this kind of regulation. And I think there's a very compelling case to be made there. Uh, I, and, and I think the, the public would be willing to listen if the, if the faction really presented to them. There was an interesting poll that I read in early February where uh, they, um, uh, moviegoers were polled and they were asked if they supported or opposed SOPA and they were like 70, 30 against because this was after um, Wikipedia and Google were telling them to, to be against it. Um, but they were also asked, um, uh, whether they thought online piracy issues could be solved with, could be resolved without governmental action, or whether they thought the government needed to be involved, and they came out almost 80 to 20 in favor of the view that government needed to be involved in some way to deal with this problem. So I think that there, uh, the the entertainment industry and, and the other content industries, and I think that will include the book industry because I think there's going to be more piracy of ebooks now that that's. Uh, 
viable distribution model and one that people are making money on. I think, the, I think the publishing industry may decide that that's something they need to deal with because uh, historically when, when you were just dealing with books in paper form, it wasn't, it wasn't as, as good a deal. Um, I think I think the case needs to be it's going to have to be made to the public, and, and I think I think it can be. I think it's a compelling story to be told. So I, I, I think that uh, let's let that be the last word. Uh, the, um, with a kinder, gentler approach. Uh, uh, let's give these folks a hand for. Uh, <laughs>